afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this press conference with the three anti-torture mechanisms. My name is Julia Grunewitt. I'm the communications officer for the UN Human Rights Office here in New York. Uh, the three participants here are the um, Special Rapporteur on Torture, Mr. Nils Melster here, the Mr. Jens Moodvig, the chair of the uh, Committee Against Torture in the middle, and finally, we have uh, Mr. Malcolm Evans, the special rapporteur, uh, the um, chair of the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. So they are uh, here to tell you about their activities over the year. Uh, just a quick reminder, the committee's job is to monitor that states are complying with the Convention Against Torture. And the subcommittee's job is that it carries out visits to countries to check on the human rights of people who are detained. And the special rapporteur has a mandate from the Human Rights Council to work against torture worldwide. Uh, we'll try to keep this press conference uh, pretty brief, 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, we'll start with some very short introductory remarks, and then we'll take questions from everyone. So, um, go ahead, Mr. Melzer. Yes. So this is live? Okay. Well, yeah, good morning, and, uh, and thanks for coming. Uh, maybe let me start out briefly just to remind you that as a special rapporteur on torture, I'm not the so-called treaty mechanism. I have a kind of a generic mandate by the Human Rights Council to report and to evaluate the compliance and report on the compliance of states with the provision of torture worldwide. So it's a, it's, it's a mandate that covers all UN member states and aspiring UN member states. And in doing so, I do basically three things. I, I visit countries and evaluate their prison systems, it's two to three countries Per, per year, and obviously their, their whole legislation and the, the way they, they deal with the provision of torture. The second pillar is that I do thematic reports to the General Assembly once a year and, and to the Human Rights Council in Geneva on any given topic that I feel needs to be put on the international agenda in relation to the provision of torture. And the third pillar is that I do, on a daily basis, individual interventions on behalf of, of individuals exposed to the risk of torture or extradition to a country where they may be tortured and so on. So that's about, yeah, I receive about 10 requests per working day, and I can deal with the resources I have, with perhaps two. So that's what I do. Uh, in this past year, I have visited the, the Comoros, small island state between Madagascar and, and South Africa. A uh, visit that I unfortunately had to cut short because I did not get access to all of the prisons. Um, I, I'm also planning to visit the Maldives in November this year and, and evaluate, evaluate their systems. <clears throat> and the next year, I, I hope to go to Burkina Faso and to Paraguay. Um, in terms of thematic reports this year, I picked up a very controversial issue uh, on the issue of domestic violence. I felt that I, I looked into this issue and I saw that every day uh, in all regions of the world, uh, women and children predominantly, but also men, millions, are being exposed to uh, at times extremely cruel treatment ranging from you know, psychological, mental uh, 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 oppression to uh, mutilation to murder, I think 70,000 femicides only in 2018. Um, so alarming numbers in terms of the, of, of, of the scale of this problem um, that are in fact about comparable to the deaths and injuries that are caused by all armed conflicts in the world at, in the given same time period. But while war is recognized as the so-called scourge of mankind, private uh, uh, domestic violence is very much regarded as a private matter in, in, in most countries. And so I felt I, I wanted to put this on the agenda that uh, states, although domestic violence usually is not an act of state, states still have an obligation to positively kind of protect their populations from these types of, of, of violence. And uh, so I hope to make that my recommendations that I made to the states uh, may help them to become aware of the scale and the gravity of the problem and uh, and also to take measures to, to try to address that, as difficult as it may be. Uh, and then briefly, uh, in terms of individual interventions, uh, there was a very uh, 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 publicized case. Uh, I visited Julian Assange in London, in Belmarsh Prison, on the 9th of May, and uh, uh, then also reported back to the UK, to Sweden, the US, and Ecuador, the four states that were mainly responsible for his treatment in the past six years. Um, and... <coughs> I visited him with two medical experts. We came to the conclusion that had he had been exposed to psychological torture 
for a, a prolonged period of time. That's a medical assessment. And uh, uh, we asked the four involved states to investigate this case and to, to uh, alleviate the pressure that is being done on him and especially to uh, respect his due process rights, which, in my view, have been systematically violated in all these jurisdictions. Unfortunately, none of the involved states has, have agreed to conduct an investigation, although that is their obligation under the Convention on Torture. They don't have to agree with my assessment, but they are obliged to conduct a uh, investigation uh, into this case, which has not been done. They have basically just rejected my assessment. So I, I think I close it here, and perhaps uh, there may be questions afterwards. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much, <clears throat> and thanks for your interest. Uh, I have the pleasure of being chairperson of the Committee Against Torture, which comprises 10 independent experts. Uh, elected by all the state parties to the Convention Against Torture. That's 169 state parties. So they elect the members of the committee. And our job is to be the custodians of the convention, and that means we meet in Geneva three months a year where we consider reports from the state parties. All the 169 state parties are obliged to report to us every four years about what they have been doing to implement the convention, and we consider the reports, and we receive a delegation from the country in question, uh, and over a two-day uh, Q&A session, we uh, examine the country's report and put elaborate questions to what they have been doing and not doing, and uh, we issue concluding observations at the end of the session. In uh, this year, we will be reviewing 16 different countries, and uh, most of them have actually reported uh, to us. Uh, however, some countries do not live up to their reporting obligations. And uh, in this uh, session this summer, we reviewed Bangladesh, who actually ratified the Convention Against Torture in 1998, and the initial report was then due 1999. Uh, we did not receive it, so we scheduled Bangladesh for a review in the absence of a report this summer. It had very beneficial results because three days before the review, they submitted a report to us, and they showed up with a delegation of 20 experts headed by the Minister of Justice. So in a way, we have managed also to get a country like Bangladesh, who has huge problems with torture and lack of investigation of these cases, into a re regular reporting uh, cycle where we can regularly review and scrutinize the situation there. Thank you. Um, the chair of the subcommittee, if you would like to. Thank you very much. Um, I'm chair of the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, which is rather different to the uh, Committee Against Torture, and the work that we engage with is um, a little bit of a hybrid in some ways between the, um, the, 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 my two colleagues on the table here today with me. We are comprised of 25 members who were elected by the now 90 states' parties to the optional protocol to the um, torture convention. Um, and we have states' parties from all the regions of the world. In fact, the region with the most states' parties now is, is Africa. Our work is focused on two things. First of all, we are empowered to conduct visits to places where we believe people may be uh, in detention in any of our state's parties without any prior notice. Uh, we have the right to go to any such place, have immediate access to be able to interview in, in confidence any person who may be detained there, see any part of the premises, look at any form of documentation, etc., etc. And on the basis of our of our direct observations and our work in places of detention, we compile a report on what we consider the situation and the issues to be, which is then given to the uh, country concerned, and we discuss with them what we believe should be done to improve the protections of persons against the risk of torture and ill treatment whilst in, in detention. In some ways, much of the work of our committee is a, a journalist nightmare, be, and indeed a nightmare for me when speaking to, to journalists because our reports are confidential. 
Uh, it is one of the, the hallmarks of the system that our exchanges are confidential. We do have um, this remarkable right of access, and under the terms of the Convention, confidentiality is an important part of that relationship. However, many states do choose to make their reports public, which we welcome, and that enables a greater degree of transparency both over what we find but also of uh, the developments that may be taking place to address them. But that is one tranche of the work that we do. The other um, is a very innovative role, for, which is to oversee the establishment of what are called national preventive mechanisms in each of the countries which are a party to the optional protocol. In essence, all states are obliged to establish such a mechanism within one year of becoming a state party. And it is meant to be able to operate in precisely the same way that we do the ability to go wherever it wishes within the country in order to be able to see at no notice uh, the situation of those persons deprived of their liberty and likewise enter into discussion and produce reports which in this instance need not be confidential which are handed to the states. For us, because of our inevitably limited ability as a UN committee to visit all our now 90 states parties, the establishment and support of effective national mechanisms in the countries is of supreme importance. These are the front line in terms of prevention of torture and ill-treatment in those countries and our function is to support the establishment of them and to support their running. So far, about 65 such mechanisms have been established, which does mean that 22 countries have yet to establish these mechanisms, and some have been overdue for quite some period of time. We publish a list on our website, which lists, I think, now 12 countries which are more than four years um, um, over, uh, since they ratified and have not yet done so. And indeed, there are at least five states which have been more than 10 years in establishing such a mechanism. And we think that this is a very serious failure to embrace the, um, the purpose of the, of the optional protocol and a failure to put in place those things which are essential for the protection of, of, of persons deprived of their liberty. But it's not only putting mechanisms in place which is important, it is maintaining them, working constructively with them and not frustrating their work. And one of the things that we are increasingly distressed to find to the extent to which some states having established mechanisms seem to f find it quite easy to put hurdles in their way of effectively operating. And indeed in the course of this year we have been having extensive exchanges with one of our state's parties, Brazil, uh, which has recently introduced some decrees that come close to effectively undermining the practical operation of the NPM in, in, in practice. We are in discussion with um, Brazil and we do hope that that situation can be resolved in the, in, in, in the near future. It is so important uh, that, that it is. And to give some idea of why it is so important, um, I thought it might be helpful if I just pulled out a few examples of the sort of things not related to any particular country, but which over the course of time we have, we have run into. Um, we have, for example, and picking up on the on the comments that the Special Rapporteur has mentioned, you know, situations where we find persons with disabilities who have been chained for prolonged periods in, in, in detention, lying in, in dreadful um, physical conditions. Interrogation techniques, including tying plastic bags over the heads. Routine order in places of detention maintained with um, barbed electric batons, sexual abuse of men, women and children as forms of interrogation, punishment or indeed just becoming a part of a way of life in some detention settings. Routine beatings, purposefully shackling people in, in painful positions and, and so on and so forth. In places of detention, lack of provision of essential food and water in sanitary conditions, the absence of medical supplies, and for those uh, taken into custody, um, 
guarantees in theory of legal process which in reality do not exist in practice. These are all things which over the course of time we have encountered and it's our job to enter into serious discussions with states in order to try to ensure that they put in place the means and the mechanisms to make sure that these and many other of the things that we know go on in places of detention which absolutely should not are effectively addressed. Of course, none of this is possible if it is not properly supported. And so it is a matter of great concern to us with the current financial problems that are affecting the UN system that indeed our final visits of this year have had to be called off for financial reasons. This has never happened to us before. We hope it never happens again because we, like my colleagues, are working to secure in the interests of those who are some of the most vulnerable in our societies and it's absolutely imperative that that work should continue. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So when we now move on to questions, uh, I'll call on you if you could um, say, the, say your name and which media you're from when you ask questions. Do we have anyone representing UNCA here today? Yeah? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from the Daily Arabic al Arab al-Jadid newspaper. I have a couple of questions for the Special Repertoire on torture. You talked about uh, domestic violence and um, explain a little bit why you decided to include this can you, uh, could you please elaborate on that and which steps you think also countries should take and uh, if you could also make the connection, if there is one, uh, between sometimes oppression, political oppression, and how some countries are using this also at some, um, as part of uh, controlling minorities and... Um, etc. Uh, and the connection between domestic violence and political oppression. And the second question regarding Assange, you said that he was uh, subject to psychological torture. Uh, could you uh, say more on that? Uh, by which country, etc. And I have a third question, I'm not sure to whom. Uh, it's regarding whether uh, detention centers like um, the ones where immigrants are uh, to which extent where is maybe there is no torture in the sense th that we expect but uh, or we would uh, but do you look also uh, at such uh, detention centers whether in Europe or even in the US uh, and the conditions there and are they related to uh, torture thank you Yes, well, well, thank you. Uh, I, on the domestic violence, obviously, this is, is this huge topic, right? So my issue was, as I explained, was just that I saw that in, in terms of substantive gravity, what, what people suffer in their own homes, children and women mainly, but also some men, um, and in the scale of millions, is, is in terms of gravity is just equivalent to torture and ill-treatment. If this was done in a prison or during an interrogation, it would be absolutely clearly considered as torture. But because it happens in the perceived legal black hole of the home, people somehow just trivialize that and look at this as something that's more in the private sphere. So um, that's, I felt this needed to be out there and that states have a obligation to prevent these, these types of things. Now, how you do that is obviously depends very much on the context because it is different in Somalia where you have a very high rate of, of female genital mutilation, for example, happening at the homes and that's very deeply rooted in the society uh, to, a, to a different country, I don't know, in Western Europe where it's, it's, it's maybe some corporal punishment but also a lot of sexual abuse going on in, 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 at, at the homes and so on. Uh, so there's there's plenty of, 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 of a variety of, of, of contexts there and but I, f I feel that certainly what you speak to the, the discriminatory kind of frameworks and, and sometimes also policies that are being practiced by states are certainly conducive to these type of, of, of you know, consolidating, uh, conducive to, this, to these kinds of abuse and such kinds of abuse are also conducive to consolidating a discriminatory social order. That can be discriminatory between, uh, well, gender-based. It can be uh, also, it can certainly also concern um, certain population sections. Socioeconomic factors are certainly important in in producing or prevent, you know, producing such such problems or preventing to address them also because they're 
services are not accessible, judiciary is not accessible. So it's a huge topic. I fear that it's a, a, a bit difficult to comprehensively address it here, but if I'm not sufficiently clear, please uh, follow up with a, another question afterwards. Um, um, I'm not, though, because you went into also the, the political instrumentalization of this, I'm not acutely aware of a context where that's the case, but I, it cannot, it's not to be excluded, certainly. It can, it can happen. Um, on Julian Assange, the psychological torture, I think there it's just important that we really take the big picture here. Um, and we're not kind of splitting it up in thousands of procedural steps. But what this case is about is that we have um, a, a man who has founded this WikiLeaks organization and what he did uh, famously or infamous, infamously uh, uh, 10 years ago approximately, he published huge amounts of, of information that were considered secret by various states, not only the US, but obviously most prominently by the US, including evidence for uh, prima facie of war crimes. And they're all aware of the collateral murder video, which is the most uh, famous or, again, infamous piece of evidence. And what this should have triggered, these investigations by the state of the misconduct, then, obviously, I, I acknowledge that the whistleblower issues are a problem and can be a problem, and sometimes what whistleblowers do can be punishable under national law. But this also needs to be distinguished from the person actually publishing information that they received from whistleblowers. That's what investigative journalists do. States never like what investigative journalists do. And if they do it on a huge scale like this, they can get very irritated. And I think that's what happened in this case, because as soon as these publications happen, we see that several states started, I call it, ganging up to initiate uh, proceedings against him for basically just about anything they could. And so we see the, the sexual allegations in, in Sweden. We see uh, the espionage charges, as we know now, <clears throat> in the U.S. For basically what he, what he has, been, has been doing is, as I said, doing investigative journalism. So these judicial proceedings, when we look at them, each of them, in all of them, his, his due process rights have been severely violated. Evidence has been has been manipulated. Uh, his rights have not been respected, even in the UK. The last six months, it's only two weeks ago that he received access to legal documents. So for six months, he's been detained under intense pressure from the U.S. extradition uh, proceedings, and was asked in court to respond to the indictment, but had not even been able to read it. That that happen in, happens in a in a state like the UK to me, is, is, is very shocking. And judges have expressed open bias against him, have insulted him in court without him, him having any given them any, any cause for this. So what I see here, I'm not his defense counsel. I'm not saying he, is not, you know, he has not committed any offense, but the way the states, and these are my counterparts that I'm looking at, have conducted these proceedings cumulatively, have exposed him to, have isolated him and exposed him to an intense campaign of public mobbing, I'd say, and, and consistent arbitrariness where he, where the, where the medical consequences were measurable, not only psychologically, but also physically. Uh, intense anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, um, uh, I, I can't disclose everything because of the the patient-doctor confidentiality, but it was a clear pattern that's typical for persons exposed to psychological torture. Be happy to elaborate on this further as well. And just a, the, a quick remark, because I'm sure my colleagues can speak to the migration detention as well. I, I clearly, when I visit a country, I try to visit uh, uh, migration centers as well, closed ones, certainly where people are being uh, deprived of their liberty. And even if there is not well, in, in some areas, there are conditions of detention that are cruel, inhuman, or degrading, or even ill-treatment, just the Libyan camps and so on. Uh, but, but even indefinite detention can amount to ill-treatment. The longer it goes, the more severe the suffering becomes, and it can cross that threshold at some point. But I'm sure my colleagues will elaborate on that as well. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, clearly, immigration detention falls within the remit of the 
um, SBT during our visits and, of course, of the national preventive mechanisms in theirs. Our um, mandate extends to any place where a person may be deprived of their liberty and, of course, an immigration detention clearly fits with, within that. Indeed, we occasionally visit uh, camps for asylum seekers as well who, in principle, should not be under any form of um, detention as such and generally are not. But sometimes we have information that causes us to think it would be prudent to confirm that persons even who are in, um, in, in um, uh, camps for asylum seekers are de facto free uh, uh, not being deprived of their liberty in a way that um, breaches the position under the Convention. On this basis, over the past few years, we increasingly um, visit uh, such places in the context of many most of our, of, of, of our visits in, 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 in recent times. Um, you know, for example, I think one of the first times that we had a big focus on this was when we went to Nauru some years ago, uh, which, of course, is the home of a regional processing um, centre, um, and um, and in, in numerous other countries since. From really over the last um, five or six years, it's been an increasing focus of our of of of, of, our, of our work. But it's not simply going to the immigration detention centres to see both the physical conditions and the way in which people are are both treated in there and the effect of their prolonged detention in such facilities is having upon them. It's also the legal re regime surrounding them, why it is that people are being held in such places at all, um, because it is not always appropriate for them, them to be there. But also, at the other end of the spectrum, when people have have been held in immigration detention, um, how they are um, treated when they are being perhaps returned to a third country, um, the question of um, expulsion, the flights on which they are, are held, rendition flights, etc., etc. These are all things in which we are deeply interested and raise questions with many states around the uh, not only the physical realities but the system structures and processes that have fed into this. So I can absolutely say that immigration detention is something which is very, uh, ve very very much on our on on our radar screen, shall we say, in the work that we do. Yes, just quickly, um, it's a clear focus for the Convention Against Torture to look into the way uh, detained asylum seekers or rejected uh, refugees are being treated. And uh, when you, when we speak about the U.S., uh, this is. Uh, only the convention, the committee that can look into the U.S. because they have ratified the convention. So obviously we received, we could not visit, uh, but we receive uh, shadow reports from NGOs and monitoring uh, authorities that can give us information about it and we can confront that with the uh, state parties. So <clears throat> the asylum determination procedures uh, we always take an interest in because this is where you determine whether asylum seeker has actually been tortured. And if the tortured asylum seeker is returned to his home with risk for increased torture, it's a clear violation of the uh, convention. So not only in the country reviews, but also in the individual communications we receive, uh, this is a topic with a huge focus. Thank you. Could I just add... If I may just add on, on that, perhaps I, I should have said that there are some very real causes of concern. Many countries will have laws limiting the amount of time that someone can be held in immigration detention, but so many um, say they abide by these laws, but often within days, if not hours, of a person being released, um, they are uh, re-detained re and taken to the detention facilities. Quite often the detention centres for immigration detention um, are not really detention centres, they are prisons. And in effect you have situations where persons are really being held in prison-like conditions subjected to what are effect prison-like regimes for not months but years on a revolving door basis effectively beyond the reach of effective scrutiny um, because of the nature of the systems in which they work, and I think they are. Um, you know, there are some very real problems with the way in which immigration detention is handled in in many places. Thank you very much for the press conference. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayam from the uh, Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi, that is based in London, <clears throat> and I have few questions about your relations with Israel. 
Uh, can you elaborate on the kind of relations you have with Israel? Have you visited the country? Have you met with some Palestinians who had been tortured? And do you consider the detention, for an, an indefinite det- detention, with no charges as form of uh, torture? Uh, and do you know that the Supreme Court in Israel had approved some kind of, uh, some methods of torture uh, under the justification that it could prevent terrorism? And are you aware of the case of this young woman called Hiba al Labadi who had been picked on, from the bridge and she has, she said, uh, or her, in fact, her lawyer said, she has been physically and psychologically tortured and she's been on hunger strike for three weeks. That is one thing. But my second question is about naming and shaming. Some of the countries, member of the convention, do not care about naming and shaming. Is there another method? Is there something that could be developed that it goes beyond just naming and shaming those who practice torture? Thank you very much. Yeah, first and foremost, Israel is a party to the Convention Against Torture, which means that they are not only uh, agreed uh, not to commit torture, but also to a long range of uh, preventive measures. And we reviewed uh, Israel, I believe, in uh, around three years ago, and were uh, very critical to the way uh, Palestinian uh, prisoners are actually being uh, uh, treated here. <coughs> Uh, the second part of your question was... About the young woman. Yeah, no, we, we don't have uh, specific information about this, but we certainly have information about the Supreme Court uh, judgment that in reality allows uh, torture again to take place, and we have uh, uh, been critical uh, about this. But the way the committee uh, uh, works is that we have these regular reviews and uh, in, in this case, Israel came to Geneva and we had the dialogue and we issued concluding observations uh, with the recommendations for Israel inter alia to uh, ratify the OPCAT, which they have not done, uh, meaning that, they, they, that they're still not outside scrutiny in uh, Israel, uh, Israeli places of detention. And my second question was... Yes, yes. Certainly, uh, uh, the Committee Against Torture is not limiting itself to naming and shaming. Uh, It is uh, sometimes very uh, technical uh, um, recommendations about uh, how to uh, undertake review of the the way people are detained, the way they are interrogated, and their right to uh, raise an investigation, as uh, uh, Mr. Melzer uh, addressed before which is an obligation according to the convention. Yeah, well, I, I just briefly on this, because I, I used to work in the area at, in, a different, in my previous life for the International Committee of the Red Cross, and so I know that obviously there they have the, this overlap between human rights law and humanitarian law. And uh, if, to the extent that humanitarian law is still applicable, um, the Fourth Geneva Convention can be used as a basis for de facto almost indefinite security detention as long as you review it every six months and come to the conclusion that there is a continued security threat, uh, it's very difficult to to say that it's unlawful formally. But that system can obviously also be uh, abused to prolong detention uh, abusively. Uh, What in this context, I I know it's very important to, to, to be aware that even where the Geneva Convention formally allows it, the security threat assessment has a proportionality assessment. How how serious is the security threat and how serious is the infringement of the the provision of liberty? And the longer internment without charge lasts, the more severe, as in the case of migration, the suffering becomes, and the more important the security threat must be and more immediate in order to justify the continuation of detention. So so the presumption is really that at some point it simply becomes disproportionate and therefore unlawful to continue detention. So that's, I think, was an important thing to clarify because it inter- it's interwoven with humanitarian law. Obviously, there can never be any justification for torture. I mean, the utilitarian argument of it helps us to protect lives is in the end self-defeating. And we know that from experience because it does not work. 
It simply does not work. What it does, it creates an, a system of torture, inevitably, which uh, is inherently arbitrary and will lead to, to, uh, to, to developments that uh, we ought to have overcome already uh, two generations ago with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there cannot be, under any circumstances, any justification for uh, torture and ill treatment. It dehumanizes not only the, the victim, but also the perpetrator. And, and, and the entire societies that tolerate such abuse. So I think that needs to be made very, very clear. Um, I'm not specifically aware of the case. Um, I haven't, uh, yeah, I have not received, or at least it has not reached me, uh, a request uh, to act on her behalf. Um, but uh, certainly these types of allegations would need to be investigated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I could just make one point. Um, as my colleagues have already pointed out, um, Israel is not a state party to the optional protocol, and so uh, we would not have anything to say directly uh, on that matter as such. But I think it is worth just pointing out that the state of Palestine is, and that we have been working actively with the state of Palestine to try to ensure that we can establish a national preventive mechanism that will be working uh, with it um, to ensure that there are effective protections against torture and ill treatment in its detention facilities as well as, as I say, establ establishing the national preventive mechanism and that we are hoping to visit the state of Palestine in order to pursue this work with them. Uh, we have announced that we will be, be doing so and so we hope to be able to do that as soon as um, necessary um, travel documentation becomes available to us to do so. Um, the uh, um, um, the, the Palestinian authorities have been hugely cooperative with us throughout all this process. And so we, we, um, we, we, we look to be furthering our work with them in the near future. Yes, thank you. My name is Oscar Bolanos from OMB News, Independent News uh, Worldwide. And my question is regarding the situation in Venezuela. And recently, the UN Human Rights ordered an investigation on several crimes committed in the country, including torture and other crimes when people have been in prison from the political issues. So what is that you can tell us about this, all these violations in, in Venezuela regarding all these matters of torture and crimes against uh, prisoners and all that? Thank you. Yeah, Venezuela is a party to the Convention Against Torture, and we reviewed Venezuela, I believe, three years ago, uh, when there was an intensification of the political crackdown on, on opposition. We uh, reacted with a follow-up letter to uh, 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 the government of Venezuela, which actually uh, attracted a lot of media attention in the Latin American press. Uh, we did not receive a reply to this follow-up letter, but... Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we uh, issued uh, conclusions about the dire human rights situation in, and the torture situation in Venezuela at that point. Since then, we have not reviewed them, but we are waiting for their next uh, periodic report. If, sorry, if I just add very briefly in relation to that, uh, Venezuela is not a state party to the optional protocol, though it did sign the convention in, back in 2011, and naturally we would hope that it would become a state party so we could begin to undertake our work in relation to it. Thank you. Uh, okay, I have like very short questions regarding the situation in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and whether you were able to do any investigation there. Thank you. I mean, just quickly, I, I did request a visit to, uh, to Egypt, and uh, unfortunately it was, it was not granted, uh, and that would be obviously an extremely important thing to do. Um, we recently also even planned to have a conference uh, on uh, the prohibition of torture in Egypt, uh, which was quite controversial. Should we actually do it in Egypt? Um, I understand that there were, you know, hesitations there, and in the end, the conference was even cancelled. Uh, my own position is sometimes, uh, you know, it's we, 
There is no state that has no, no problems with the provision of torture, and uh, we should not divide the world in good states and bad states. Um, but it is true that these types of events should not be abused as a fig leaf. So. You had a comment on that? Yeah, uh, Egypt is uh, a party to the Convention Against Torture. Uh, they haven't reported for a number of years. I don't remember if it's around 10 years or so. Uh, but in the Convention Against Torture, there's a possibility of doing a, a confidential inquiry in case uh, the committee receives information that torture is systematic. And that was actually the case in Egypt, and we undertook a confidential inquiry uh, over a couple of years. We sought the collaboration of Egypt to undertake a visit uh, to uh, look into the conditions in places of detention. This was denied. So we had to carry out the inquiry uh, with the means and information available. Uh, we keep the results confidential. However, we have uh, the right to publish a summary in our annual report, which we did two years ago, uh, with the main findings that indeed uh, there's systematic torture in Egypt. Sorry? Uh, Saudi Arabia was reviewed uh, again two or three years ago. Uh, and as, as always, with a lot of uh, uh, concerns and, and uh, uh, recommendations, which I don't have the details right now, but they are all publicly available in our website. So if you're interested, we can look into it afterwards. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I, I want to ask about your relations with the UN. On one hand, you are hired as experts and in your personal capacity and you get $1 a year, that makes you not a UN staff. On the other, your reports go to the UN Human Rights Council. So when the report came from, from uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Anis uh, Kalamar about the murder of Khashoggi, some countries said, oh, this is UN report, and the other said, no, 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 she is writing this report on her personal capacity. And so we are really confused sometimes. C can you explain this relationship? Is it a UN report? Is that, does, does it represent the official position of the United Nations that includes the Secretary General? That is my, ex my question. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, obviously, I, as a special rapporteur, I'm very much precisely in the same position as, as Agnès Calamar. And, uh, and certainly in the Assange case, the UN was very clear publicly that I was an independent expert, <laughs> <laughs> while in other situations, they're very proud for me to be a UN expert. No, so it, it, I think it is a bit of a play on words sometimes, but uh, formally, I cannot represent the United Nations Organization of States' official opinion. I'm, a, I'm a, in that sense, an independent expert that has been mandated by that organization to report to that organization. It gives me a certain authority and a certain uh, visibility, uh, uh, clearly, and, and an affiliation with the UN, but I do not represent, I don't speak for the United Nations, I speak to the United Nations. And I've mandated by the, uh, the United Nations to do that, if that. It's a UN document that publishes, the United Nations publishes the opinion of the expert that it has mandated, hopefully based on my credibility. <laughs> but it is, I think it's, important, it's an important point. I don't speak for the UN, but they mandate me to, because I'm an expert, expert in this field, to investigate this and report back to them. But they can still form their own opinion based on my findings. Position? Yeah, uh, in, in, the, in the Committee Against Torture, we are not a UN body either. Uh, we are elected as individual experts to form the Committee Against Torture, and we are an independent human rights mechanism, and we uh, issue our own working methods, and we do our own conclusions, and they are not binding upon uh, the UN uh, in terms of political uh, implications, but of course they have the authority just like uh, 
the special rapporteur, they have the authority of being the views of an expert body that is functioning independently of political matters. And indeed, just to be clear, the SBT is a treaty body in exactly the same way as the Committee Against Torture. Um, we owe our legal existence to states' parties. Uh, the governing body, if you like, is not the, the United Nations. It is the conference of states' parties who are the ones who elect the members. Um, and once again, the role of the, 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 the UN is to provide, if you like, support for the work as mandate as provided within the convention. And so, of course, they, as has been explained, will produce the work. Um, it will be put forward, it will be considered, but we are acting as independent experts uh, in accordance with the terms of the convention. I understand it can look quite strange from the outside, um, but um, uh, it we're is... Not it, we're not staff. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have one last question? Go ahead. Ann and Charles, Baltic Review. What can you tell us about the way the Baltic states and the Nordic countries deal with the subjects of torture and detention? Have you visited? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if I can start um, on, on this, the um, um, two of the Baltic states are, are states parties to the convention um, uh, to, to, to the optional protocol. Uh, we have worked uh, with both of those, Estonia and Lithuania, in the establishment of their national preventive mechanisms. Um, and so um, we haven't directly visited them using our own visiting mandate, but we are certainly aware and support the the, the work of the national preventive mechanisms in those countries, which work in accordance with the, um, in, as, as I outlined earlier, what their functions are. And so I'm happy to say that they are part of the family and um, they're operating within that framework, which is a very good thing. Maybe just, I mean, I, I just want to say that uh, Denmark in particular, I'd like to, you know, I also thank them, thank them every year because they're very supportive of, of the mandate uh, politically, and, 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 and uh, that also applies to Norway. Uh, both states, I have experienced, as very supportive of my, of my mandate because the issue of, of anti-torture measures and that fight is very important to them. Um, I've had some issues with Sweden in the Assange case, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on that one. But uh, for the other two countries I just mentioned, I'm very positive. I have no experience with the, the Baltic states. I haven't had... I haven't asked to visit, and I have not received many complaints about those states. Okay, so if I may add, uh, hmm. all countries have issues. Also, all countries have issues with regard to uh, torture or prevention of torture. We reviewed Norway recently, uh, and we found that uh, the cells in some of the police stations were very critis uh, uh, cr critical in terms of space and windows, which were not there. And Denmark has been, my own country, has been severely criticized by the committee for not granting uh, medical torture examination to those asylum seekers that claim that they have been tortured. So we find issues everywhere. Hmm. And so with that, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, thanks to the panel. <laughs>